getting ready for the exam, I'm gonna, let's go through this. So you got to talk about all four of these, all right? You can't just tell me, and it's not a multiple choice question. So you don't say, oh, it's a C, and you hope you got a 25% chance. So let's start with which ones do we reject? There's only one we have to reject here. Price to Ibit, right? So it's a bad ratio because price is stockholders and Ibit is before interest. So stockholders and bondholders. All right, so that one we can reject. Price to earnings works for all stocks. So you can always use price to earnings, that's fine. It's not the best one for tech, it's not the most normal one we use for tech, that's fine. Price to book ratio is fine, but not typically used for tech companies. You don't have to tell me what it is used for. You know, this is typically used for banks, uh, energy company, the companies that produce energy or commodities, um, materials, companies, those type of things, firms with a lot of book value, uh, a lot of property plant equipment. So you're left with this one, best ratio for tech companies focus on growth. So that's what we're looking for here, all right? So if you see price, the numerator needs to be either earnings or book value. He sees enterprise value, it needs to be EBI, something, EBIT or EBITDA, um, our revenue. Um, so those are the ones. Peg ratio, I might give you that. Peg ratio is perfectly fine because that's just the PE ratio, but that's used pretty heavily with tech companies. I can't think of industry that doesn't use price to earnings, though material companies, price to earnings is little really volatile firms price to earnings is a little bit tricky because it can just reflect what the earnings have done recently all right all right so okay on the second one i didn't bring my answer key but we can work these out so strike price of 220 expiring in july so we know we're going to be doing the gain it's going to equal the max here it's the stock minus the strike comma zero minus the option premium so it's going to equal the max of the stock is 220 oh strike is 220 i'm sorry the stock is 235 220 and zero so that's 15 dollars minus so a strike of 220 in july strike of 220 in july so what's the option premium 650 because we're buying i don't know what that is eight what what is it what did i get i see 850 is that right all right so most students get you get that one right. So if you got that right, that's good, but most people do. So then on the put, same thing. You know you're going to have the gain to equal the max. Here you're going to do the strike minus the stock. Here minus the option premium, but still pretty, pretty straightforward. So here equals the max. Uh, here the strike is 210. The stock is 195 minus and the premium. Again, we're buying, so 1880. So minus 380. I'm seeing some minus 380s. All right, looks like pretty straightforward stuff, right? I'm still amazed this YouTube video gets, I got another comment this week. Oh, this is great. It's exactly what I'm looking for. It's like, how could you be looking for? I mean, it's pretty straightforward stuff, isn't it? All right, covered call. So we were long what? Long the stock. 
and short a call. So the gain is going to be the change in the stock price minus, and then you just put the call formula that you just did, the exact same formula that you did up here. But it's all in parentheses. Why? Because you're sorting it. So you're gonna same formula. It's just you're gonna you're gonna do it um, the opposite sign. So here, the change in the stock price is stocks trading for one ninety five. At initiation it was two hundred. So we lose five dollars on the stock minus. So here we have the max. Uh, the stock, the stock is 195 minus the strike, 220 comma zero. So that's gonna be zero minus the call premium. But here the call premium is gonna be a little different, isn't it? It's gonna be $4, right? Because we're selling the call. So minus four, that's an equal, $5 loss on stock plus four gain on short call equals a loss of a dollar. Does that sound right? Anybody get that? Team two looks like you got it, but I can't tell. You just say one, but you don't have a negative one. So it's awfully close, but uh, I'll give you some. Team four has it set up right, but then got, they got minus $9. How do you think they got minus $9? So they decided, hey, I wanna short this call, but I'm gonna pay you the $4. That's what they decided to do. I wouldn't recommend you do that. You get the four dollars, so really, really close. All right, and then the last one is pretty, pretty easy because we know that the option premium equals the intrinsic value plus time value, and we've been using the intrinsic value formula all all over the place. So the intrinsic Value for a put equals a max of strike minus stock comma zero. So our option premium is 1880. So 1880 equals, and let's get the intrinsic value. Intrinsic value is the max of the strike. Our strike is 210 minus the stock is 200 comma zero. So that equals 10, right? So it equals time value plus 10. So the time value equals what? 880. How many got that one? That one's not, these, ah, team one. Wow, that might be enough to separate one and two. Two didn't, two elected blank. What was y'all's issue? Ah, 880 team, team three. Where's team three? Where's team three? Y'all, yeah, 880, good job. I don't see any other 880s. Let's see team seven here. How does I get 15 for the intrinsic value? I have to look at that. All right. So the time value is 880, the intrinsic value. You see how we just, the intrinsic value formula, you just use it over and over and over again. If you have that down, you just gotta you know, figure out what you're gonna, how you're gonna use it, but it's fairly straightforward. All right. So sometime, maybe Friday, I was thinking about doing Sunday, but the exam's on Monday, so that doesn't really help you much. So sometime Friday, I'll 
I'll work an exam. I can't remember if I put one out there for y'all, but if I did, I'll have to look at it again because if the exam I gave you is questions we've been working already. I might pick another exam to work so you have you don't have the same problems over again. But I'll set up something on Zoom and you can sit in on it if you want to. Otherwise, I'll just work that entire exam, put it out there on, on um, Blackboard so you have another exam to practice. It's there's there's no tricks on this exam. So if you don't make a hundred on an exam, I don't understand it. it. Makes no sense to me. It's just very straightforward. Students say there's so much to memorize, but there's not a single thing to memorize on this exam. Because there's not a single thing on this exam you shouldn't know as a finance major. So there's zero memorization needed because you should already know all of this, right? You're going to graduate, you got to know stuff, right? Here's stuff. You is there anything on the exam you shouldn't know? Absolutely not. This is basic foundational. There's not a single question I'm asking anywhere on this exam that you shouldn't know off the top of your head as a finance major. So that's the good news. You don't have to memorize anything. You already know it. You just got to do it on the exam. So that, that's an advantage. All right. So any final discussions on, on the exam here? I can't remember what I put out there, so we'll, we'll see. Yeah, so I have another practice exam, but I don't remember what that is. Let's see, maybe it's the same one we just did now. No, it's Hormel, so it is a different one. So I'll do this one. I, can't, I don't think we did many Hormel during the semester. We may have switched between Hormel and F5. I don't know. We'll see. I'll have to look and see. Uh, but I'll work, I will work this exam sometime uh, a couple of days before our actual exam. But you have one where you determine the beta and apply that to cap M. You have one where you value the stock using those three models. You value the bond. I lost my number here, but this is a question. <laughs> Where's my question here? So that's number three. Number four is the return calculation. Five is one we just did, six is one we just did. So six questions. No essays here, other than you do have to talk a little bit on the uh, relative value one. But, um, and you do have to talk a little bit on the beta. Remember on the beta, you gotta do the four steps, but it's not really essays, it's just ration, rationale for your answer. So it should be, everybody should make a hundred on this exam. So any final questions on the exam? All right. Whatever's on the schedule, I can't remember. I think it's at three, but I can't remember. All right. So the one thing we skipped over that I want to do come back to is futures because we didn't really cover futures. I hate futures. I just don't, my brain doesn't think futures. I'm a swap guy. I love swaps. They make a lot more sense to me. Um, <clears throat> futures and swaps essentially are the same thing. Remember I had that book on the CFA exam where they just showed mathematically a swap and a future are exactly the same thing. And they do give you the same results. It just in my mind, the swap makes a lot more sense. It's just, it just clicks exactly what we're doing. Whereas the futures, uh, it's a little trickier. Um, so a future is very different from an option where you're you're actually taking a position. You're going to have a gain or a loss. With the option, you pay the two dollars for the option, and worst case, you lose two dollars. That's not true of futures. With futures, whether you're buying or selling. With options, if you sell the option, you can have a lot of exposure. But if you buy the option, you know up front the worst you can do. That's not true with futures. You don't know your worst case with futures. It can be really, really bad, whether you're buying or selling, too. With options, shorting options, boy, that's a risky thing to do with. Futures, it doesn't matter. Buying or selling is a very risky thing to do because you have a very, very, very uh, levered exposure because it obligates you to buy something at a price in the future. So let's... That sounds like debt. It's a very um, scary kind of uh, transaction. So when you go long and when you go short, you go long when you think the price is really important, when you think the price of the underlying is going up. 
you sort when you think the price underlying is going down. So some, some people get real confused on interest rates futures. If you're doing a treasury future, you're not betting that interest, if you're long treasury futures, you're not betting rates are rising, you're betting that they're falling because it's the price of the bond, it's not the interest rates, all right? So futures on bonds, a long position, you're betting rates are falling, all right? So long position, you're bullish on the asset, a short position, you're bearish on the asset. Um, we, we've looked at FinViz before. They've got a pretty good list of, of futures. Um, you could make your whole career on this in just one particular futures. If you want to do coffee futures or, or cattle futures or whatever, you can make a whole career out of that. There are people who have done that. Um, obviously, you can do currencies. And that's that's its own, own world. Um, you can do stocks, interest rate, I mean, bonds, whatever. Uh, precious metals. There's a lot of transactions out there that are available. Um, let's use an example of oil. So you have the spot price. What's the spot price? If you went out and bought a barrel of oil today, that's what you would pay. That's the spot price, the price today. Why don't we just say the price because it just sounds fancier to say spot price. <laughs> the price today, the spot price. Um, let's say oil is $100 and the futures price is 102 so it says, well, well, that I could buy oil today and sell the futures, and I've got a locked in two dollar gain. There's no way I can lose on that transaction. But can you lose on that transaction? So what happens if you buy the oil today? Two things happen. So you you're at your apartment. Some of y'all live in apartments, right? And let's say you buy a thousand barrels of oil today. What happens? A big truck shows up at your apartment. What are you gonna do? You're going to leave them in your driveway? A thousand barrels? Probably not. It's going to cost you some money to store them somewhere. You can go to one of the storage places. They're pretty expensive, and a thousand barrels is a lot of space. What's the other thing that you have a problem with? Well, you just spent $100 to borrow oil, so you're out the money. So you have what we call storage, cost, and time value money. So storage costs is how much is going to cost you to store that oil until you do something with it. All right. So if it costs you a dollar fifty, then yeah, you can buy the oil today for a hundred bucks, store it for a dollar fifty for the next three months, and then yeah, you're going to make two dollars for sure on that barrel. You get to sell it for one hundred two. So yeah, you buy the oil today, sell the future for one hundred two. You will make two dollars for sure, but you're going to spend a dollar fifty storing it. And then your time value money, you could have just taken that $100 and just put it in a risk-free three-month security. You would have made 50 cents. So how would you have done with all that transaction? It probably wouldn't have been worth it, but it, you got to take care of all of it. You got to call all your friends, hey, I got a barrel, thousand barrels of oil. Can you help me? I got to take it over to my storage unit. You're not going to pay them, but you're going to probably have to buy pizza, right? That's going to cost you some money. So at the end of it all, you're probably better off not doing anything, would you say? The incredible waste of time. So that's what we call this, this $2, the fifty the store and the 50 cents for time value, we call that cost of carry. Now, let's say we do this with the stock market. Let's say the stock market is trading for 100 and you can sell that stock market for 102 in three months. What's your storage cost? Pretty much zero. So all you have there is time value. What if your time value is 50 cents, what would you do? I do, I'd buy a trillion dollars of stocks today and I would short sell the futures at 102. My time value is 50 cents. I'm gonna make them, that I'll do all day. Is the futures market gonna let you do that? No, it's gonna be perfectly priced and you can't do that. What about the oil market though? Is it possible the oil market, the spot price would be 102 but the futures price is 100. That sounds too good to be true, right? So you short oil today at 102. You buy the futures at 100. You got a locked in two in, and you don't have to store anything, right? Because you shorted the oil. That sounds really good with one little problem. What's the one little problem? 
How do you short oil? I mean, you can try it. So your neighbor has 100 barrels of oil, and so you pick up the phone, and you sell his 100 barrels of oil. You can do that with his stock, right? He has 100 shares of Apple. You can short his 100 shares of Apple as long as you get them back to him when he needs them. But can you sh sell his 100 shares, his 100 barrels or whatever? Oil well, can't do it. It's really hard, hard to short physical assets. Can you sell your neighbor's house if you think it's overpriced? That'd be pretty tough too, right? You can sell his stocks, you can sell his bonds, but you can't sell his oil, you can't sell his up. So it is it is possible that the spot price is 102 and the futures price is 100. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. Now, if you own oil, you could. Like if you have a thousand barrels, you can sell it for 102 and do the futures market for 100. And yeah, I would definitely do that. If I were Exxon or someone, yeah, that would be pretty interesting to do. And you know Valero and all of them are doing that on their trade desk, watching that all the time. So you would think the normal situation would be for the spot price to be lower than the futures price because of storage and time value money. But that's not always the case, but that's what you would assume. That's called contango. Contango was in the spot price is lower than the futures price. Now, I've heard, I even heard a finance student saying this. The spot price is 100. The futures price is 102. The market's predicting that oil prices are going to rise. That's not true. Futures prices are not, well, let me, let me put it like this. Let's say the market thinks oil prices are going to rise. What would oil prices do today if everyone thinks oil prices are going to rise? They would rise today, wouldn't they? Is, are people out there going, man, oil pricing can be higher, um, but I have no choice. I got to pay today's price. I mean, I got to sell at today's price. No, if you think price is going to rise, what's going to happen? The price is going to go up today. There is no such thing in finances that we think something's going to happen in the future, but we can't do anything about it today. No, we'll, we'll make the same decision today that we're going to make in the future. If everybody thinks interest rates are going to rise dramatically in the next three months, what would they do today? They're going to rise dramatically today, right? So I don't believe the future market is a forecasting market, especially on the stock market. Because of the stock market, if it's a forecast, you don't really care. You just buy you buy the one that's underpriced and you sell the one that's overpriced and you got an arbitrage profit. You don't care if the market's right or wrong in its forecast. You're going to make a fortune on that. So is it possible that the contango is wrong? That the spot's 100, but that your storage cost is only 75 cents. Well, that may be true for you, and you can take advantage of that if you can store stuff cheaper. Let's say your uncle has a big farm, and he says, hey, a 1,000 barrels? Yeah, it's, it's nothing. You know, you're out in West Texas. It's nothing but sand and, and rabbits. Yeah, why not? Let's put some barrels out there. You can store it for free. And you just have the time value. Yeah, in that case, yeah, you probably could get away with that. I'm not real sure how they get the oil to your uncle's farm. <laughs> So how many college buddies do you have with pickup trucks? And you're probably going to pay for the gasoline. And I don't know if you can own barrels. Do you? Do you all own barrels? <laughs> so you still got some problems. But if you had it all set up and it was really good, then maybe you could get this work. It'd be really tough. Uh, but there's also backwardation. Backwardation is when the spot is higher than the futures. And that does happen in oil prices more often than you would think. I don't know how often because I'm not an oil person. At all, I don't follow this market, but backwardation can happen frequently. I mean, it's not like an incredibly rare, rare thing to happen. I don't know where oil prices are today versus futures. Um, so, and backwardation is not the market saying they're expecting prices to fall necessarily. Backwardation can sometimes be an issue of storage capacity. We saw that, what was it, two years ago when futures actually went negative or the spot actually went negative? Um, people are saying, you know, what transactions can we do there? And why do they go negative? Because there's no place to store their oil. So, yeah, if you could have bought the oil, but where do you go? Where do you go get this oil for negative? You could say, hey, y'all can store oil at my place. You got a, a tanker showing up with, you know, a few thousand barrels of oil. You better have a place for them to put the spigot and go. So, um, so a lot of times with oil, because it's a physical asset and it needs to be stored somewhere, you can get these market disruptions because we just run out of space or whatever is going on with, with Putin and all that kind of stuff. 
And things like natural gas, you can get strange phenomena because I don't know what the disruption between the US and Europe on that gas, but it was pretty different, wasn't it? Prices were a lot cheaper here than there because it's not just storage, but it's also pipelines, it's getting stuff there. So that's a physical asset. You don't see that kind of stuff with treasuries and stocks and because there's no the delivery, there's no storage delivery and it's all time value money. So those markets are pretty straightforward. I don't know other markets like coffee. We sell coffee in Costa Rica. I don't know, you know, how much coffee prices affect them. I do send them, you know, emails every once in a while. Hey, coffee prices are up 50%. It probably impacts them some. Um, when last time we were there, they were selling most of their coffee to the local community. It's like, how are you gonna sell all this stuff? Right? We were, they ran out of coffee. They couldn't even sell us. They had enough bags, they had this other bags. So I was like worried because you walk into their storage area and there was this coffee stacked everywhere, but they're having no trouble selling it. I don't know what that price there is. So you have local markets that can be really different. Um, they sell bananas all over the world, which is to me pretty, pretty amazing. Um, so, you know, these are pretty interesting markets. I, I like it because every market's gonna be different. So if, you, if this is your expertise, we need one of y'all to become a coffee trader so that we can introduce you to our Costa Rican people and we can maybe get some inside scoop on how to do coffee. Um, but they're unique markets. You learn them, you know, which country is doing what and what's going on with weather and all those kind of things. Um, and that's kind of the other thing. I'm, I'm not an expert at all, but you talk about futures on something that's not just storable, but also perishable. Is weather related. Oil's not so much impacted by weather, but oranges and bananas and coffee can be. I don't think coffee's all that impacted by weather, but it could be. You have a drought someplace. Costa Rica has been hit with some really bad uh, diseases hitting their coffee. So all the things are going to affect prices, but it's a global market. And so you got to see what's going on where and understand that. So it, it could be a whole career if you find that kind of stuff interesting. Uh, but that's backwardization. So with physical items like oil, like like uh, other agricultural goods, um, markets can get in kind of strange out of whack positions. Um, we talked about the notional amount. The notional amount is extremely important that you know what your notional amount is. Because when you enter a future, so remember what's, what's the market value of the future when you enter the contract? Anybody remember that? Second one, it's zero. Yeah, worthless. Not worthless, but it's zero. But it's going to change, and it's going to change if you do it on a hundred barrels of oil versus a thousand. It's going to change a tenfold difference. So just because the market value is zero, you still got to know what that notional amount is because that's going to tell you if it's a hundred barrels versus a thousand, a ten dollar change in oil price is going to have a ten times different hit on you. Um, I think the gains and losses are pretty straightforward because you just, you know, you, if oil prices go up 10 bucks and you're long oil futures, you're going to make 10 bucks. I and mean, it's pretty straightforward. Now, what happens at expiration? So let's say you do a thousand barrels and at expiration, are you going to receive that oil at your house? Most contracts don't, don't expire. Most contracts you, you do the opposite trade, you know, the day before expiration. Uh, so if you went long a thousand barrels of oil, the day before it expires, you'll go short a thousand, you'll be out of the contract, you don't have to worry about it. So you don't want this stuff showing up and they probably wouldn't know how to show up to your house anyway. Uh, you know, there's, these, these are pretty specific markets. Uh, that's the same thing with options. Most options expire by the person, or most options you get out of them by actually not exercising the option, what you actually do is you sell the option or buy it back or whatever. At expir so like at USA, we never execute our options, but the day before expiration, uh, we, would do, we would sell it, get our gain or loss or whatever, and, and get out of the transaction. Um, if it was worth zero, we just wanted to expire worthless, and we would do that. Although I learned uh, something one day, I come into work, our options expired worthless because I saw the open there. Their price off the op open on the Friday. I was so happy. I called, I called Stu at Credit Suisse of all places. He doesn't work there anymore. But when he worked there, I called him and said, hey, looks like we just barely came under the line. Our option expired worthless because uh, we were short the option. So we we're really happy that it expired worthless. Right when you're short, you're kind of glad. 
And he said, no, you're, it's actually going to cost you, it wasn't much, but it's going to cost you 300,000 bucks. And I was like, 300,000? No, the open was, was, um, is actually uh, below our strike because it was a foot. He said, no, that's the open that you saw, but that's not the official open. We don't know the official open until like 11 a.m. I was like, what? What is this? Some kind of scam going on you guys are doing? But he had, there's an, there's an open that you see, and then there's the official open that options are priced off of. And because of that, we missed about a few pennies. That times, you know, a large notional amount that we had to pay. It wasn't this you know, it was only a few hundred thousand bucks, but still irritating that I had to send send the money over. Um, they don't actually expire technically. I don't know about futures, but with options, they actually expire on the Saturday. And the reason they do that is that gives you all day on Friday to do something because if you if you let it expire in the money, there's going to be a transaction you may not want to have happen. And so you're better off getting out of it on that Friday. But you do have all day Friday to make your transactions. Futures are probably somewhat similar because you definitely don't want a bunch of oranges showing up at your, at your apartment. Um, and again, I'm, I'm not sure they could even do that because they probably don't know where your apartment is. Um, so looking at these gains and losses, just the thing to remember is your gain and loss is gonna look like you had the thousand barrels of oil, but that's just gonna be the change in the amount. So you don't actually have a thousand barrels, but the change in your market value is gonna be as if you did. That's why we call it the notion. Notional is kind of a strange concept of voice, extremely important. All right, so swaps. I don't know if y'all done swaps in other classes. My risk class, we did swaps. Do y'all do swaps? Swaps are, to me, they're a lot cooler. Um, a swap is essentially a forward. So futures are exchange traded forwards and swaps are over the counter, much more flexibility. Um, I don't know if swaps and futures, I don't think there's a hundred percent overlap. So swaps, you think you usually think of swaps on currencies and interest rates. Those are the key ones you think of. Um, futures can do those and a lot of other things. So swaps are, are really pretty heavily used, especially currencies. You see a lot of them, but also banks use them a lot for interest rate management. In fact, a lot of banks like a JP Morgan will use futures and swaps. Why do they do both of them? I don't know. There's probably some transaction they're trying to hit um, to get a little bit cheaper trading. Um, yeah, so we talked about futures. So futures are exchange traded. Is there risk there? Let's say you have a future and you're up $50,000. Are you worried about the exchange going out of business and not being able to reimburse you on that? Probably not. Why not? Because when you owe fifty thousand dollars, what does the exchange say? You got to put down a cash, cash collateral. So you got all this cash collateral. But there have been some days when markets been really, really fast. There were some brokers getting a little bit worried about collecting, and they'll shut you down in a nanosecond. I mean, they're not going to take risk on your on your side. So, uh, but generally, we're not that worried about futures. Forwards, on the other hand, because over the counter, you've got exposure to a particular entity, some investment banker, JP Morgan, whoever it is. So you have what we call counterparty risk. In that case, when you're at 50,000 bucks and your counterparty is, um, I don't know, Silicon Valley Bank, um, yeah, now you're worried because if they go out of business, you're not going to get your money. So you have to really watch that. So you still have collateral uh, and you do have to watch that collateral. It was kind of cool in my case because I was dealing with JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley. I wasn't worried about JP Morgan in 2008. I was very worried about Morgan Stanley. But the nice thing I had was they were worried about me. And I was like, you know, this is USAA, very highly rated. This is our pension plan. We have far more assets than we possibly need. And they said, no, we're so worried. We want extra collateral. I said, okay. You want extra collateral, guess what I want? I want extra collateral. So I was more than happy to do that because it was really quite easy. I don't know if you do futures, you're kind of irritated with the cash calls and the collateral, I didn't care. I had a $3 billion pension plan. I needed a billion dollars in collateral. I was like, here, take, take what you need. 
You want the entire three billion? I, I didn't care. On the on the uh, PNC side, property casualty side, they see they say we need a bond that can be collateral. I go to Donna and say, Donna, I need a billion dollar bond. Says I got I got twenty of them. You know what do you need? I need a bond that you're going to hold the maturity. You're not going to do anything with. He says, Yeah, we'll take what you need. So that's called hypothecation. I didn't really care. I knew we were going to pay our bills. They wanted collateral. It's like, take what you need. So it actually worked out in my favor that these banks who really didn't understand us at all wanted extra collateral. I'm saying, fine, I'll, I'll negotiate that as long as they're willing to put up. Because I really want, I mean, think about Morgan Stanley. Does that sound like a safe institution? Sounds like it now. What about in 2008? I mean, y'all know what happened in 2008. Y'all need to go read those books. There were several books written. So Bear Stearns goes over under in February and J.P. Morgan buys them out. Lehman goes under. The weekend, Lehman's going under. Everybody's getting together. Who's going who's gonna to buy out Merrill Lynch? Everybody says, no one, we're not touching Merrill Lynch. Well, everybody knows if Merrill Lynch goes under, Morgan Stanley goes under. If Morgan Stanley goes under, Goldman Sachs goes under. So if no one buys, we know Mer Le Lehman's gone. Everybody's just like, nothing we can do about that. They're gone. But Merrill Lynch is the next one, and nobody wants Merrill Lynch. Why? Because nobody knows what they are. Very complicated entity. Their losses could be a billion. They could be 40 billion. Nobody knows. Do you want to buy something where you don't know how much the loss is going to be? And then at the last second, who bought them out? Last second. Bank of America. Why? Who knows? They could have waited to Monday, probably bought them for $2 a share and said they paid $30 a share or something ridiculous. I think it was $30. Why did Bank of America buy them? It was a terrible transaction. Why? Because this is this regional North Carolina kind of unsophisticated bank and they're going to own Merrill Lynch. It was like, hey, forget JP Morgan, Chase, all those. This is Bank of America. They bought it, I think, entirely based on ego of the CEO that he wanted to own Merrill Lynch. I can't think of any other reason. Do you think I was happy he bought Merrill Lynch? Yeah, we were, we were all dying that weekend. Almost literally, our heart rates were well above 300. Um, it was an incredibly difficult weekend. And yeah, so Bank of America bought out Merrill Lynch. Morgan and Goldman survived just barely. They had to restructure themselves quite dramatically. We started the year with Mayors, Lehman, Merrill, Morgan, and Goldman. At the end, we only had Morgan and Goldman, and they both had to restructure themselves from investment banks to more commercial type banks. Very, very scary. We had Lehman Brothers actually called us that year to do some structured debt. And we said, you mean with Lehman? And he said, well, we'll put it on somebody else's paper. So even at that point, they were saying, yeah, we're pretty dangerous. They weren't saying it in public, but they knew I did not want Lehman Brothers counterparty risks just because of what happened to Bear Stearns. So why are these entities so risky? Well, because Bear Stearns, Merrill, uh, Lehman, they're funded with continuous short-term debt. They have to go to the market every single day to get millions and millions of dollars. So if the market loses trust in them, they're done. This isn't like they borrowed money for 10 years and they got to get their act together before that 10-year note is due. That's not the kind of, we're talking every single day. And once they lose that confidence, that's that's why you're seeing Goldman doing all these checking accounts and savings accounts. Anybody, y'all biting their accounts with these high rates? They're trying to get deposits, right? That's why everybody loves Frost Bank. Frost Bank has all these deposits. Um, so why are they doing that? Because deposits are stickier than going to the market every single day. But then Silicon Valley just discovered in First Republic that deposits maybe aren't that sticky. Right? People might, might move that money out. So you have to worry about the other side of these transactions on futures and options, you don't generally worry about it because usually your broker's got the collateral, you got the exchange, you got plenty there. But when you start doing forwards and swaps, you've got to you got to start worrying about the credit quality. And you're worried when they owe you. When you owe them, you're like, hopefully they'll go under, maybe they'll lose my contract, and I'll be happy. But when they owe you, that's when you have to worry about it. Um, and and the key with counterparty risks is they might not owe you anything. 
but you still have an exposure because interest rates could change tomorrow and suddenly they owe you. And that was my big thing with Morgan Stanley is they owed us, but not only owe us, but if Lehman and Merrill went under, Merrill Lynch was going to owe us a lot more money on Monday because interest rates were really going to take a nosedive. And I was going to have to go to my CEO and say, hey, guess what? Our hedge worked. Morgan Stanley now owns us $300 million. The bad news is they just announced bankruptcies, so we can only get 50 million of that the collateral. That, you know, that's not what you want to tell your boss. We had a really good hedge. Unfortunately, we can't collect because they're bankrupt. So counterparty risk is not something to take lightly. One thing you have to be really, really cautious of are some of these exchange traded funds that trade on these, um, these gold markets and oil markets and those kind of things because a lot of them are using swaps. And there's been some pretty interesting articles that the counterparty risk on these, you might see oil prices shoot up and you think, wow, I just made a bunch of money on that ETF. And you may discover that the counterparty that they're expecting to get all the gains from went insolvent and you're not gonna, you're not gonna get your money back. So be real careful when you do an exchange trading fund on anything that's, that's kind of indexed to some kind of underlying, especially a commodity, I would look into their prospectus and see, are they using swaps? Are they using boards? What's their, what's their policy on counterparty risk? Because it, you, you can end up really losing a lot of money. Um, Futures is really just a way to uh, invest in something without having to put the money out today. But ultimately, you're going to settle in cash, not physical delivery, because who wants to handle all of that? All right. So that's the last slide. Um, so what do you remember from the class? Anything? Can anybody still do DC cuts I? Duration? Convexity. Is convexity important? Let me show you something. Here's an article. So I got this article today from GMO. Agency MBS focus on current coupons. Here's the option adjusted spread. MBS, and they're saying it's 95 basis points, and they're saying that's unusually high right now. So they're essentially telling you that MBS is paying really, really well. Um, Mortgage-backed securities have struggled. Why? Interest rate volatility. Didn't we talk about that? What is convexity? If you're long convexity, you're, you're what? You're, hope, you're assuming rates are going to be volatile. You're short convexity. You're assuming they're going to be stable. They're saying mortgage backs have underperformed treasuries because of that reason, even though treasuries have sold off. Investors simply looking to add MBS on the cheapness of the spreads. Underlying mortgages of these are concentrated. They say you, and then this is the other thing they're saying, mortgage backs, it's not just do you want mortgage backs, but which coupon do you want? Do you want the low coupons? Like two and a half and three, what's the chance someone with a two and a half percent mortgage is going to prepay, refinance their mortgage? You have a two and a half percent thirty-year mortgage. Are you refinancing right now? Probably not. So what did he say? The borrowers didn't we talk about this embedded prepayment option? If you'd read that three months ago, you'd be like, "Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about." But now you know. It's an embedded option. What did he say right after that? Minimum negative convexity. Why? Because they're not going to prepay the mortgage. You got your two and a half percent. You're going to get it. It's locked in. But they're saying, however, you should do current coupons. It's a way to gain exposure to cheapness on the market while expressing a high level, uh, a view that high levels of volatility will mean revert. What are they saying? Interest rates are volatile and they can stay volatile, but they're not going to be as volatile as currently priced in, which means mortgage. But they're talking the exact stuff we're talking about, right? So here's an article three months ago. You'd be like, what are these guys talking about? And now you're like, oh, this is old hat. I don't know this stuff. It's a piece of cake. So duration, convexity. What was the next one? Credit, pretty, pretty critically important to understand credit. Then U.S. versus non-U.S. Right now, currencies are a big deal. Taxes. Structure. In inflation, right? We we're talking inflation in my um, my PNC class. 
Um, in fact, the transaction I want to do, if I were still at USA, is a, an inflation-linked corporate bond. And how in the world would you do that? They don't exist. So I said, what if you short nominal tre treasuries, buy tips, and buy corporates, what would you end up with? You'd end up with an inflation-linked corporate bond. That seems pretty cool, but I'm not at USA anymore, so I can't do that. So y'all need to go there and tell them, hey, we can buy inflation-linked corporates by shorting treasuries, buying tips. Okay. Um, so what about bucks? Beta? US versus non-US? Capitalization, small cap, large cap? And style, yes. So you remember all that. So you remember some of this, right? If I've got a bond with a five-year duration and rates are going to rise 200 basis points, what's the price of that bond going to do? Five-year duration, rates rise 200 basis points. Should be able to do it in your mind in a nanosecond. Drop how much? So my duration is five years. 200 basis points rise and lose 10%. Minus duration times the change in yield, minus five times 0 0.02, minus 10%. All right, so y'all don't remember that part. But, um, and then everything on the exam, you should remember this, but it's still basic, basic, basic stuff. DC cuts I on a scale of 100. Where are you on bonds now in your knowledge base? Where? 89? Okay, well, I'm, I'm out at like 0 0.03. So if you're at 89, you might be able to Why am I at 0 0.03? Because there's so much in bonds. It's just crazy, crazy, crazy stuff that you can do. So don't forget this stuff or you just wasted your whole, your whole time. I know there's students who want to graduate knowing as little as possible, and they think they've accomplished something, but I don't think you have accomplished nothing. So retain this stuff. All right, so I wish you good luck and we'll see you on the exam. I'll try to get your papers graded by Friday or Saturday. We'll see.